uh, Mark, uh, Rob Mann here. Um, just so people watching this know, Mark's in uh, Western Sydney at the moment. Um, I'm down in Melbourne, La Trobe University. This is part of a series for what's called Idea and Society program for La Trobe University. Um, and I'm very pleased uh, and grateful that you're able to come along and talk about, um, in, in particular, the New South Wales catastrophe for Labor. In general, I think, Labor and social democracy um, in Australia and beyond. Um, if I can just say this, Mark, um, I was one of the people who was very taken with your diary. Um, a lot of the um, political uh, commentariat and the politicians uh, had trouble with it. Uh, most of it seemed to have an incredible readership, however, of let's call them ordinary people. Um, I think now we can see that a lot of what you said in the diary was rather prophetic to do with the dysfunctional nature of labour culture, um, which at the time I think was perhaps harder for people to see. Um, it was quite a time ago. So perhaps I want to do the obvious thing, which is ask you to, to, to perhaps beginning with Western Sydney, to say what you think were the reasons for the catastrophe, the predictable catastrophe that happened to Labor um, last weekend? Uh, well, I think there are uh, two interesting case studies in Western Sydney, uh, two electorates that Labor lost uh, with 20% swings. I think when the party gets a 20% swing anywhere, you need to drill down into um, the local factors and looking at the local candidates. And the two seats are Smithfield and, and Campbelltown. Smithfield is you know, quintessential Western Sydney, um, had been held by our former police and transport minister, Carl Scully. And the fellow who was elected in 2007, Ninos Kashaba, uh, suffered a 10% swing then. And then last Saturday, he suffered another 20% swing. So Labor's lost 30% of its two-party preferred vote in the seat of Smithfield in the space of two elections. It's gone from 75% of the two-party preferred vote to 45 which is an absolutely uh, stunning disintegration of the Labor vote. And I know the Kashab as well, because Carl Scully, the previous member, always boasted that they were fantastic in terms of recruiting uh, Syrian uh, members to the Labor Party. And um, Anwar Kashab had done that, and now Ninos, who's lost the seat, I suppose he stands as the first experiment in uh, an ethnic branch stacker dynasty in the Labor Party. And I think it's a very, very interesting case study in how the internal dynamic in the Labor Party was that, well, if we get the numbers here for the right wing over the left and we'll bring in all these uh, Syrian uh, people into the local branches, um, then control of the Labor Party numbers in Western Sydney was the pathway to a parliamentary career. That it, the, the real political contest was getting the numbers inside the party, not having to worry about the votes outside the party. So the whole thing is caved in. Uh, to the point where uh, branch stacking in the seat of Smithfield is not sufficient to deliver someone a parliamentary career. There's the novel perspective that you actually have to win the votes of the electorate. And Ninos Kashaba has lost 30% of the two-party preferred vote in, in the space of, uh, of four years. Uh, the other seat that's of interest, also a 20% swing, uh, is the seat of Campbelltown. I, I'm sitting in the Campbelltown campus now, so uh, we're right in the middle of it. Uh, the sitting member, Graham West, um, uh, retired at this election. He saw the writing on the wall. Um, and he was replaced by Nick Bleasdale, who didn't live in the electorate. Uh, he lived uh, in the adjoining seat of Macquarie Fields. But Nick's interesting because he represents what has become the new prototype Labor candidate. He's a carpenter. Uh, Mark Arbib, when he was the party secretary, uh, very keen on looking at the focus group results, picked up animosity to what had been, and I suppose the last 20 years has been a a damning commentary on Labor that the too many candidates are political staffers, union officials. So in key seats, Arbib got into the habit of just finding someone who had non-staffer, non-union credentials. <laughs> and they plucked uh, Bluesdale from the air because he's a carpenter. Now, you don't have to be a carpenter who lives in the seat or knows anyone in the seat or has a popular following in the local electorate. But the, you uh, have to be a carpenter. Uh, prototype is to pick someone, in this case a tradie, and just put him forward on the basis that he's, he's non-staffer. Well, that wasn't sufficient either, because the Liberals put up a, a local uh, policeman who was known in the community, 
and with the other factors that uh, contributed to a big anti-Labor swing in Campbelltown, the Liberals were able to pick up a seat they've, they've never held in its current form as a suburban seat. Uh, they held it in the 1960s, but uh, in the last 40 years it's been safe Labor and the party suffered a 20% swing, not because Bleasdale's a bad person, he's not, he's quite a nice fellow, but he just wasn't credentialed in that electorate. And they overlooked some people who had come through the local branches and were known in the local area to pick Bleasdale on the OBIB model of just pick someone because of their professional uh, title, not because of their popularity or profile in the seat. So I think in Smithfield and Campbelltown you've got um, a, a terrible breakdown really in the Labor model of culture and candidate selection and the result on the ground has been devastating. And how, I mean, how large a factor do you think selection of candidates is compared to, I mean, looking at the situation from Victoria, as where I am, I suppose there have been three or four general factors that have been stressed by the commentariat. Uh, one would be the, the toxic nature of the factional system. Another would be the dysfunctional nature of the right-wing Sussex street machine. Um, and you know there are many other, and, and another thing that, that keeps on cropping up is the power of trade union bosses um, and the uh, effect they've had on New South Wales Labor over time. So I suppose what I'm asking you is how these very general factors that um, commentators are now concentrating on, how they relate down at the grassroots to uh, mistakes made in candidate selection. Well, the factors you've mentioned are almost uh, cliches now about the modern Labor Party. They're bandied around in the, in the, in the political analysis and media debate. Um, but I think it's very useful to understand that when we talk about the generation of Labor culture, it has a local electorate consequence. And we shouldn't just look at these things as generalised slogans about the, the nature of the modern Labor Party. Uh, you need to analyse what happens where it matters, and that is in, in holding lower house seats, yeah, uh, yeah. winning or, or losing government. And the example in Smithfield, where the whole internal party focus was on ethnic branch stacking and getting the numbers locally, no regard for what the electorate thought about any of this, uh, that's a, a classic instance of where the insular <laughs> dysfunctional culture of Labor, which is discussed generally, uh, down on the ground has had a devastating impact in losing what had been a traditional Labor seat. So too, the commentary about union officials and union domination. There has been a, a Labor Party uh, reaction against that, recognising that in marginal seats now, because of the, 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 the public's understanding of terms like faceless men, union bosses, factional thuggery, the whole um, imagery of um, Joe Tripodi and Eddie Obeid as um, so-called factional devils in New South Wales. The party has reacted um, to try and look for a clever way of countering that in, in, in key seats, in, in seats where there's a contest. And the uh, reaction in the seat of Campbelltown, replacing a sitting member, was to bring in a fellow solely for the reason that he, he could call himself a carpenter. Mm. Well, it might have worked uh, for Christ and his family, but it wasn't <laughs> going to work in Campbelltown. And um, we're, we're both uh, lessened in that, 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 that uh, the, the real problem in both instances, Smithfield and Campbelltown, the, the ethnic branch stacker and the carpenter, is that the Labor culture has hollowed out so badly. There are no viable Labor Party branches. Uh, 30 or 40 years ago, um, joining the Labor Party, uh, one went to branches where there were genuine working people who came for a genuine reason, in numbers, to discuss issues, local, state, federal, international, and a young person joining up had to go through the rigours of genuine political debate. You argued the toss with local uh, social democratic working class warriors, veterans of uh, many years of branch debate. Uh, all those debates, those contests, that political grounding has been lost. Mm -hmm. And the Labor Party has bred a generation of candidates and members who have credentials based on imagery, that is, they're, um, they're not uh, a union official or a, a staffer, um, or credentials based on ethnic branch stacking, the, the, the factional control of numbers or people who were just plain unsuited to a parliamentary life. And one of the stunning things about New South Wales is just the amazing number of scandals, the number of uh, backbenchers and ministers who got pinged for rorting electorate allowances, travel allowances, 
surfing the web for porn on their parliamentary computer. Uh, all things that I think wouldn't have happened 30 or 40 years ago in the Labor Party. We had a genuine grounding in real politics, real debate, real contest of ideas. And you didn't have to go through the process of imagery or ethnic branch stacking to be a Labor member. You could do it because you were an effective debater and propagator of political ideas through the local branch system. So that, that culture is now gone and it's been replaced by something we saw on Saturday that uh, in electoral terms is a devastating flop. Can I just take on from that? In the diary, I, I, th I think I remember that you um, report having a conversation with Bob Carr and he's saying that the days in which you can get a rank and file membership are over. I think you also, I, it's you or someone was quoting Oscar Wilde saying that um, you, won't bring, you won't ever be able to bring about socialism because it would take up too many evenings uh, if committee meeting. Um, is there a sense in which your analysis is to do with something that all political parties, not just Labor and New South Wales faces, which is the death of that sort of, even if I might call it even old-fashioned political commitment? And they, that every time the Labor Party goes into analysis now, as it has recently with the Carr and Faulkner and Steve Brax report, there is an, an, a, a renewed fantasy about getting mass membership of, of the of party branches, but it kind of never happens. Can, can you respond to all that? Well, it is fantasy um, for the reason that um, uh, the times have changed and, and, and these problems are not necessarily um, confined to, to Labor, they're problems uh, across all parties in all parts of the Western world. But I, I think for parties left of centre, parties that rely on ideas, a sense of momentum from social progress, social equity, that cause, call themselves a, a political cause, a movement, uh, you do rely much more than the conservative side of politics on a sense of popular support. And uh, a core group of, um, of party activists at the local level who can make a difference. Uh, I think it is more important to have mass membership on the Labor side than on the Conservative side of politics. But uh, the two trends working against that, of course, are the, you know, the end of the Cold War, the political debates are not as mm -hmm. clearly defined or as intensely fought as they were um, 40 years ago. Um, and the other trend is, is changing technology. Uh, people sitting in working class suburbs now, the local branch meeting with its fiercely contested political debates and um, battle-scarred veterans beating up on young hopefuls coming through the branch system. For a lot of people that was entertaining. That was a good thing to go do on a Monday night. But now with uh, the internet, uh, social media, uh, the popularity of television itself, um, people have got other forms of entertainment and interest mm -hmm. in their lives. And uh, politics is, is fading into some sort of weird novelty that people engage in like we're doing now because you know, we're sort of <coughs> We're oddballs. That's how politics is seen. People who talk seriously about politics in the general community are, see, are seen as odd. Um, so the hope of having a, a, a broad mass membership in a political party has, has faded away. But there's a big difference between uh, those challenges and what Labor has become. And that is a tightly controlled oligarchy without any amount of political debate and contest. Yes. Uh, sure, you might be able to sustain 100 active branches across Sydney. Well, consolidate them into 10, where you do have genuine debate and political grounding and experience for young people coming through the system, so they will be effective parliamentarians in the future, instead of having the cancer of ethnic brain stacking or the, 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 the imagery of recruiting people as candidates um, uh, for all the wrong reasons. So uh, there are things you can do to maintain a viable, contested political culture, as opposed to what Labor has done, which is just to collapse the local branch system and uh, concentrate uh, influence and power in the party in the hands of um, a dozen uh, union officials and party officials.